Oh, dann schauen wir mal. Äh. So, ich glaube, wir werden heute nicht mehr mehr. Dann fangen wir mal an, sobald ich unsere virtuelle Maschine hier hochgefahren habe. Ähm, also nur auf falls ihr es ah, switch to English out of to stay in the habit. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. Uh, last time we worked with an autoencoder and for this we used Torch, which is a Python framework for uh, neural networks. And because these Torch things run much faster on a GPU than on a CPU, I used a computer with a GPU. And This one year, oh, it's actually already running, so I don't even need to start it up. It's provided by the DENBI, the Deutsche National Bioinformatics Infrastructure. So you see a German-English mixture abbreviation, uh, which depicts its name of being a national-wide network. The actual machine happens to stand just over there in BioQuant, in the basement, and yep. And now I start my uh, pi and torch activate. Mm, yeah. And for some reason, it has forgotten all my stuff of last time, so now I have to ah, here. This is what I need. Eight, eight, seven, one. See if it starts.
output, my microphone is running out of battery. Let's see if this works, otherwise uh, I better quickly switch to the uh, settings sound. Look, this is, yes, there seems to be enough panel that one can hear me, so let's try. Okay. So in the meantime, it has loaded here the data. We did our usual log normalization, calculate highly variable genes by taking those with the highest variance, taking the gene means, and now let's first do a PCA so that we have a base loss to compare to. We want to be better than this PCA. Now here is what the PCA, here we have tried the PCA, reconstruct the PCA by taking our fractions centralized, so here with the uh, with the gene means already subtracted, and we calculate the loss per number, and you see uh, the mean square loss is 0 0.34. And now my first attempt is to run this as a simple network, as you always do it, and in torch, as if you do this in proper torch fashion, the way how you do, how you're supposed to do is that you define networks which contain of modules and big networks put together smaller modules. And each module contains parameters which we optimize over. And the simplest module we can work with here is the linear module, which is simply a tensor. In this case, a tensor with 1500 input dimensions and 30 output dimensions. So it is a tensor which takes a 1500 dimensional vector and compresses it to a 30 dimensional. In other words, it's a, so a linear map from R1500 to R30. In other words, it's a 1500 by 30 matrix. Uh, but of course, you can be more general. For example, if you use neural networks to treat images, you uh, might say my input is a 1000 by 1000 pixel image, so it's a 1000 by 1000 matrix of gray point values, and I want to compress this into a 1000 dimensional vector. Then you'd say I have a linear operation which maps 1000 by 1000 dimensional matrices linearly to a thousand dimensional vectors and then you have uh, two input and one output dimension. But in our case we have it easy, we just have one input and one output dimension. And typically a linear operation is actually what mathematicians like to call not a linear map but an affine map. So a map which operates a linear operator and then adds a constant vector to the output. Basically a matrix times vector plus constant vector. This ve constant vector is called the bias vector. And because I want to, uh, and at the moment I switch off a bias vector because I want to simply reconstruct our PCA and our PCA is simply a matrix without bias vector. So you have only one layer. At the moment here I have only one layer. I simply want to reconstruct the PCA that we did. So I encode by going from 1500 to 30 and I decode by going from 30 to 1500. Here with linear operators always made the way that we go from input to output dimensions, uh, which is the exact opposite of a normal matrix. In a normal matrix, you know, if you have an n by k matrix, it, match, it maps from r to the k to r to the n, uh, they, uh, which is always annoying because in linear uh, algebra, you always have to take everything backwards, and the neuronal network people got fed up by this and decided to finally fix it, so they always write their stuff the other way around. Uh, so, this is how I define my module. It has here an init where I put it together, putting simpler modules, and I call these two matrices the encode and the decode matrix. That's already a small little difference to my, uh, to my PCA that I usually use. 
because in a normal PCA, what I do is that I say, I take my matrix Y, I multiply it with my PCA matrix R, and then I undo it by multiply it with a transpose, and this gives me now my um, uh, removed vector. So this is in, so this is um, uh, K by N matrix. And as you can see, this and this, the, the encoding and the decoding matrix is the same in a PCA. And here I leave this open and say uh, both matrices are, can be different. If, assuming that we know that the PCA is optimal, we have shown that the PCA is, gives us the optimal reconstruction, the best that is possible with linear operators. So even if you make these matrices differently, the maximum, should be, maximum likelihood should be achieved when the two matrices are the same. And we can check this afterwards. Uh, maybe plus minus some rotation which is left in. Here is now my, uh, when I define my network nodule, a second function which I call the forward function, which makes the cap, which takes the input and pushes it through the network towards the output. So it takes an input y and it runs the input y through the first linear map. So it expects y to be 1500 dimensional and then gets a 30 dimensional vector which I call latent. Which is, which is our PCA scores. And then I take the Latin vector, push it through the second matrix to get uh, the reconstruction, which I call Y hat. You see, this is the hat. It's this little roof on top, which the statisticians like to put on all of the vectors which they reconstruct. And then I return this Y hat. And here you see how we use this network. What I first do is I take my input data, uh, which is here the log, uh, my log fractions, so the log normalized data, centered. That means with a gene means already subtracted. You remember the normal PCA function in R does this for us. Here we have to do it manually ourselves. And I've done this up here where I said L frax minus J means gives the centered fractions. And... Uh, and I, for now, I only want to run my PCA on my 1,500 most variable genes because that's what we've always done. And um, I take the, uh, and uh, I want to, and this is still a numpy vector because I've loaded it with a numpy function. And I use torches tensor thing to say I want to move it into a tensor object where a tensor object is just a normal multidimensional array plus some extra functionality to, for example, do this order differentiation magic. I also switch the data type from double to float. Uh, this is because traditionally in computing we use so-called double precision uh, um, floating point errors, which use 10 bytes of data for each uh, number. Uh, it turns out that if you switch back to single precision, which sort of became out of fashion in the 70s, so using only five bytes of data for a floating point number, uh, you only need half as much memory. And if you work with big tensors, then this is important in the extra precision from using, uh, you know, um, uh, 10 bytes instead of five bytes really doesn't matter that much here. Uh, maybe you're right. Double I triple E. Uh, yes, you're right. It's eight. And uh, how do I get to uh, uh, 53? Yeah, this is binary 64. Yes, this is double precision thing. It's one bit for the sign, 11 bits for the exponent, and 53 bits for the mantis, which we call here the significant. So, you know, in floating point numbers always are stored in the way of 1.1011 times 2 to the uh, some number, some exponent minus. Mm. So this is a binary number and this is also a binary number. And here the exponent is stored in 11 bits. So the largest number that you can uh, represent is 2 to the 11. Sorry, is 2 to the 2 to the 11. Uh, 
So 2 to V11 is 2,000. So the largest number you can represent is 2 for 2,000 or 10 to V600 or something like that, which is usually enough. And the precision is that you have uh, 11, uh, 53 binary digits. And for uh, neuronal networks, this is overkill because we are so busy to, uh, to we gain much more by having twice as much parameters by, than by having every parameter precise. So on, this is why in neuronal networks, you try to, uh, to trade precision for memory. And this is why in Torch, the standard data type is single precision. You can even switch to half and quarter precision if you really want to crank a lot of tensors into this. So for example, I've recently learned that you know, might have heard about the LAMA uh, uh, pre-trained uh, large language model. So that was the one which was leaked from Meta from the Facebook company and which now everybody uses to experiment. And if you break it down to quarter precision, it seems to still work as well as before and you can run it on an ordinary computer with a standard gaming GPU. So, Let's, so we switch our stuff to, from double to standard precision or single precision and we tell with the CUDA command to move the whole thing to the GPU's memory. If I have a look here by the way, for example, um, NVIDIA SMI here, you can see how now on my, um, on my computer there is I have a, a CPU with 16 gigabyte memory in the GPU, of which Valentin is using most. Let's hope he leads enough for us. So I move it over now. I also tell that I want a new network. And when I do this, there's network not defined. How did that happen? Uh, maybe I haven't run this part yet. Yes. So you see here, I move the data when I say I want a network, when I call this network, it makes these two linear matrix and initializes them with random numbers. There's a bit of a question what random numbers it uses. And I think the torch people came up with a heuristic, namely that they say that the numbers should be standard normal distributed or normal distributed with a mean zero and the standard deviation, which is I think the square root of the number of input dimensions or something like that. And that actually works quite well. And when I run here through my optimization loop, I decide to make 10,000 optimizations here. And in each optimization loop, I always first have to reset all the gradient accumulator. Because you remember, whenever a calculation happens, the tensor calculates the gradient factor, which it would need to contribute to a chain rule uh, uh, a multiplication. Uh, if the gradient is requested and we have to set this accumulator to zero. When we calculate it, y hat is m times y. When you call a module simply in this parenthesis thing, then torch calls internally the forward thing. So this thing here executes these two matrix multiplication. When yeah, but you don't have to. And then uh, because here I didn't do it either, you see, here I also just wrote this. And when I calculate my loss, so y hat is my reconstructed, turned into the Latin space and back to the original space, y is the data that I put in, I square it to get a mean squared error and take the mean, well, to get the mean squared error. And when I ask for the derivative of the loss with respect to all uh, parameters. The parameters here are these two things. And, and then tell the optimizer, now optimize the parameters, so these two matrices, by adding a little bit of this. And in this way, the loss goes down. And here you see the loss variables. And after 10,000 runs, I'm down with my loss to 0 0.3425. We can compare this with your original PCA loss. Here, where I calculated the PCA manually, and you see where we got a loss 0 0.32565, and here it's 0 0.32590, so probably if we run it a bit more, we would also get down to 65. So this is how, uh, this is 
how we use Torch to run our PCA. Obviously, the original PCA was much faster because it does an eigen decomposition for which there's a specific matrix and not a loop. But what we can do is to simply uh, replace the loss function, for example, with a Poisson loss. And if I run it now again with a Poisson loss, so you see this is ex this, when uh, I get a new thing. Doesn't work uh, because I replaced this N here with a capital N last time. So what have I done here? I first decided to not only move Y onto the uh, data onto the CPU, but also K, the counts, and S, the totals. So this is just the count matrix for the highly variable genes, and this is the, this is the sum along the second axis. So that means the sum of counts for each cell. And I also moved over the gene means this year. And now I can do this here. I calculate uh, Y. And of course, I might have actually rewritten Y as um, K over S plus 1E e minus 4. Uh, torch.log. Let's do it like this. Uh, stop. Uh, I think I will below uh, put this like this here uh, so that it's easier for us to see this. So let's remove that part here, just so that we can explicitly see how we calculated Y. Because before we calculated Y or L frac C here as counts over totals times to 10 to the 4 plus 1. Now I, in, I could do the same here, times 1E4 plus 1. Let's see what it says to that. The dimension of one tensor A must match the dimension of tensor B. Sure, because uh, K dot shape is a tensor of 18, 1500, and S dot shape, which are the sizes, is just 1800. Now, torches is nice thing that you can say colon comma none to add a spare dimension, a single one. And this now will make it easy, uh, will tell it now whether you uh, get through this. So this makes it, this solves our usual transposing back and forth problem. Yes. So, and now I can here run my optimization loop. Let's look at the optimization loop. It takes this Y here, adds the gene means. Uh, it takes this Y runs it through the network, which again is just two linear matrices, adds the gene means that we had before, which of course won't work now because I haven't subtracted the gene means here, minus gene means T, and now I do it the other way around because this here has to be subtracted from the columns and this from the rows, and you see how my non comma colon or colon comma non shows us how this works. And here I now do the same backwards, and I get by Poisson loss. Let me quickly check something here, yeah. And with this Poisson loss, we can now see whether we now get a better reconstruction. That's maybe a bit hard to see because uh, now we have a different loss function, so we can't really see whether we are better than the other thing, but we will see another way of seeing that this now actually improved ways in a moment. You mean uh, here? How I started with, with, uh, with uh, random numbers. I start with a random guess. Yes. You can speed up computation is considerably by starting with a PCA matrix, but now here I can show you that you can start with any random matrix.
Uh, ah. So first, it's an old tradition that in uh, numerical optimization, you always start with a random starting guess. That's what people have always been doing. The logic was that you want to avoid getting biased by anything. You want to avoid imposing structure on your solution, which might not be there. Especially if you start with a very symmetric state, like the identity or everything zero, you might sit exactly on a local maximum or on a settle point where you have a zero gradient when you don't know how to start. Your chance of getting a quick convergence is much higher when you start somewhere in the middle because the chance that the gradient is high there is high. Typically, you would run it several times unless you already have convinced yourself by good old-fashioned paper and pencil proof that the problem is convex because if a loss function is convex with respect to the, uh, uh, to the parameters, so to all the tensor elements, then of course you can expect to always get to the same thing. Here, I've run it a couple of times and I always got the same thing. I never got stuck in a local minimum. So it seems that this thing is convex, but I don't know whether this is actually, it can actually be proven. For the Poisson. For the uh, mean squared loss, we know it. Uh, for the Poisson loss, uh, we don't. Actually, an odd thing is long ago, I t before uh, I had learned torch, I tried to, calc to do exactly the same thing, uh, running it with a standard optimizer, and I failed miserably. And I always got stuck in local minima. And now it runs out of the box, and I can't understand it. Either I made a mistake, or I, uh, or I started with a stupid starting point, or, which is also possible, it might have been because I used the same matrix for encoding and decoding. Because, and GLMPCA, there is this paper here by Towns from 2019 from the Irizari group, uh, which uh, shows is the, first, uh, the first paper to actually discuss this, that you get better results if you use such a, uh, such a PCA with a Poisson loss or negative binomial loss compared to, uh, to the standard PCA. And hmm, this here? Yeah, I can add it then. And this is, uh, uh, yeah, when this came out, I, I was pretty surprised because I had, to me, the idea sounded a bit obvious that the, G, that the mean squared error, which implicit in the PCA, is the wrong loss, and that you should switch to a Poisson loss. And, but, and I have tried to implement it, and it simply didn't work. And when these people here came up, and they used some, horrible, some quite complicated a numerical trick where they somehow, in the gradient estimation, they at some point set all off-diagonal terms to zero. And I've never understood why this works and why this helps the thing. And then now, a couple of years later, I try again with Torch, and suddenly it works out of a box. One reason might be that the conversion is simply terribly slow, because you see we have run here 10,000 iterations. It only took us a minute, but without a GPU running on a CPU, this would have taken us uh, probably instead of, a, instead of a minute, it would probably have taken us an hour, and I'm not patient enough to wait an hour for a convergence while trying it out, so maybe this was just a mistake. That, uh, that uh, 2019, before the big uh, uh, TensorFlow boom, I mean, at that point, of course, the big Google and so weiter had long understood how important a tensors is in GPUs, but most people still did their numerics with a CPU, including me, which in retrospect was stupid because we spent an hour waiting for this stuff, which could have finished in a minute. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I wonder if they did the same thing, that they, try, that they put a lot of work into trying to find a clever numerical optimization uh, for something which you can brute force with a GPU, and now I don't but with something on my to-do list to reread this paper and figure out why they needed a whole paper for something which now here, for whatever reason, works in a few lines of code. Uh, yeah. They have a DCA, which I, they, so the Thais people, when did, uh, 
So, so for the others, uh, the players in this field, Rafael Irizarry is one of the all by now gray eminences of transcriptomics analysis, who's already been present in the business in since uh, micro uh, array times. So in the early times before there was signaling, when people still used microarrays to do expression, there were always these two people, Wolfgang Huber, my former boss at Emble, and Raphael Irizarry, and there was always the question, which of the methods should you use? The quantile normalization from Rafa or the VSN normalization from uh, Wolfgang? And, uh, hmm? and the biologist can tell you this up, the answer, if they are, if they are old enough to remember what an expression microarray is. It's some predecessor of sequencing. There's not even single cells. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and Fabian Theis is one of the people who started with, you might have noticed there is this, we've always worked with, or compared with Sura which has been written by Raoul Satir's group at the Weizmann for R, and about the same time, the group of Fabian Theis in Munich developed SCANPI, which is more or less the same thing in Python. So these two groups, uh, Satir and Theis, they are the groups which have sort of have always uh, maintained these two standard packages and integrated all the standard processing. So they are sort of the, the, the people who define what the standard uh, processing approaches is. And the Thais people uh, pointed out this thing that I wanted to show you now today next with deep denoising autoencoder uh, using uh, this is um, you uh, I and wrote this paper also in 2019 which goes one step further from Irisari's paper by showing uh, that adding non-linearities makes things even a bit better. So, but let's get better, let's back here and look a bit how this looks like. Last time we already looked a bit at this thing here, which is our, um, which is uh, now our reconstruction of gene number 356, that was aquaporin 4. Um, and we can see, we can now wonder whether this looks better than the reconstruction of PCA, which I think I put somewhere here or not, but actually by now it dawned on me that there might be a better way to do this. Namely, if we also do a UMAP, we can notice that the UMAP has a general issue that, I've, that, uh, that we haven't talked about much yet. So let me quickly calculate a UMAP and then I can show you this by copying here the UMAP code. ECA fit Y hat. Uh, not again. So I need to load the UMAP package. Import UMAP. Is it in small letters? Probably. Yes. So let's quickly run a UMAP. Uh, how did we call the PCA components? PCA.fit. Ah, yeah. That is this part here. Mm. Now is the question, do I need to transpose this or not? I tried with transpose. And what I will show you when in the UMAP, two cells which have the same fractions but different totals might end up at quite different places in the UMAP. And why is this? Imagine you have, uh, you have twice as high totals when this plus one in our log normalization will have only half the effect because we do, after all, log k over s plus 1, or plus, uh, so, so far we've always done this here, but alternatively we could of course also do k over s uh, plus 10 to the minus 4, which 
as you can see, is just the same as before, only minus 4 times log 10. So, uh, if I, so I can I will switch a bit back and forth between these two normalizations. Either I multiply this thing here, which, as you remember, has the advantage that if I put in k equals 0, when I get a result of 0, or I use this thing in here, which has the advantage that if k is large, then this thing here is removed and it's really actually the logarithm of a fraction, or not the logarithm of a fraction shifted by minus 4 log 10. Minus 4 log 10 is something like minus 7 or something like that. So, but either way, no matter how I write it, this thing distorts stuff a bit, and how much it distorts depends, of course, on the S, because in the end, I, the fraction is how much does the count change uh, respective to that, and this depends on the S. And Vioma picks that up. So let's have a look here at this by making plot dot scatter. Uh, umap a null comma umap comma eins. I think this is how you do that. No, this is the R way of doing it. In Python, you have to add commas and umap dot. Ah, now I have to look here how this works. Ah, here I have done the umap fit. Uh, umap.embedding. Okay. I just copy this over from here when I know how it works. So, and what I now want to do is to color these points by the total. Let's see if I manage this. Color is, I think, the totals I called them here. So let's say uh, numpy.log10 totals. Yep. And now you can see that typically the thing with low totals, the black ones, are always sort of coming out here at the border. This by itself is an interesting thing because often you see these little points in UMAPs, this point here and that point. So on. And you might think, is there something special about these cells? And actually it isn't. It's just that these cells have been badly sequenced. So uh, the, a lot of small counts are pushed to zero and that drives them away from the uh, other point. So imagine you have a couple of weak genes, which we only see if a total is large, and if a total is low, these genes all get compressed to zero. And of course, in a mean squared error, this causes problems, because uh, the error will always be with 10 to the minus 4. Or after the lock, it will be for, uh, with uh, the distance to that. And, um, and we don't want that. But the Poisson should be able to know that the difference between zero counts and one count uh, doesn't mean much if one cell has a lower uh, S than the other. So we can now check whether this scatter plot looks nicer if I plot it using my latent embedding here. So let's try that here. Well, for this, I need to first get the latent embedding. And unfortunately, I have done this a bit stupid because my network here, when I say m dot y, then I get back my reconstructed tensor. But I don't want this, so I go inside and say m dot encode dot y, and now I only get the um, now I only get the latent space. Hope so, at least. Let's have a look again at our network. Where is it? Yes, here. If I just say encode, I get the intermediate latent space. And um, let's try that. I take this here, and this now dot shape gives me something like before we had with our PCA. So I can calculate a new UMAP now with that. Here's my UMAP code because it's so unintuitive here. So let's go down here and tell it that it should use this here as our um, as, uh, as the stuff it should fit. And again, the question is, do I have to transpose it or not? Who wants to guess? 
uh, I first try it without. No. But if, and uh, probably I should have dot uh, ah, yes, and I call this boom two, and I don't lose it, and boom, and here it says numpy. You see, it has comp complained that this thing is still on the GPU, and I have to switch it back from a tensor to a normal thing, but it can't do this because it's on the GPU, so I first say move it back to the CPU. Now it complains that this is a a tensor that, that wants a, gra a, a gradient, so I have to detach it from this gradient calculation uh, back. So this is what you always have to do when you have calculated something on the GPU and you want to use it again. You have to detach it from the gradient back and put it back, push it back to the CPU, and then after a while you get this here. And let's see what we now how our plot now looks like, and I haven't tried this before, so I simply hope now that it will show what I expect it to show. Uh, sort of. We still see this stuff sticking out here, but it sort of got better a bit. Um, it's not that far out. One thing that I could imagine why it still doesn't work well is that we feed the stuff here with this thing, which still has this 1e4 thing plus 1. And maybe we should make this overall effect a bit smaller so that uh, the autoencoder can see this better. Or maybe we should give the autoencoder extra nonlinearity. So we can try this in a moment. Keep this in mind now. So this is what we got out. The humor got a bit better. We Dark and the light colors are a bit better mixed, even though it still isn't ideal. Maybe these cells are simply so weakly expressed that we can't say anything because uh, there's simply not enough data. Zero stays the data, zero no matter what you do. But at least the Poisson loss should have become a little bit better. So, what do I do next? Uh, what have I? Yeah. Uh, I've tried this a while ago. I mean, you remember at, we did this when we discussed the PCA a while ago to see how much we got better, but I didn't try it with that yet. Yes, it might be interesting to see a bit how well we can reproduce it. I've actually never tried it, yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, when I prepared this lecture, there were a lot of such things that I thought I should try this. This sounds like a job for the next intern who steps by to do a bit of simulation. <laughs> that. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're right. If you try it, let me know what comes out. But yes, of course, what you might want to do, for example, what I've tried around a little bit, but I never really finished that, is to take uh, the results of a PCA, normal PCA reconstruction as the ground truth, and then add, add new Poisson noise in it. And then, of course, you can do a downsampling uh, or upsampling in order to see how well your fractions work. So, Behind the Poisson loss. Uh, yeah, let's see where I put that. Main idea here. I think I wrote this somewhere here. Let's see if I can use my. No, we had. I have this before. I think I've never written this. I've written this on a board once, but um, modularity is. Mention reductions. Okay, then we have just have to write it again. No, it has to be single cell data because 
with an important point, and one of the things where I always have a feeling this is different in the thinking between mathematicians and physicists, because uh, statisticians usually they ask which distribution fits the data best. Physicists, and I'm a physicist, we like to say, how should we model our data generation process? So we come up with a maybe idealized model of how the data is generated. And the model that we now have is that each cell has an expected fraction. So as I said, uh, so we have a state space. Let's call it S. And this is some abstract state in which we stay, uh, spaces live, uh, in which the cells live, in which tell what uh, gene expression I expect for the cell. And I assume that from this, I map onto, a fract onto fractions. This is uh, R plus or R zero plus, which is our, which tells us for a given cell uh, what fraction of all its transcript we expect for this thing. We, we expect for a given gene. So we expect that a cell is described by some vector in this abstract state space, and this vector is somehow mapped in a manner which we can't really see into this space of fractions. Uh, let's call this not Rn, but I call it Sn, the simplex, the, N, the, uh, the space of n-dimensional simplex, or so of n-dimensional vectors which add up to one. So, uh, And this simplex, and of course, then the other thing which I get of my cells is a, a total, which I get something el somewhere else. Um, total count. So my given cell has some fractions. Let's call it, uh, what should I call them? I call it y out there. And here my state space is, and my state is, well, some unknown state out of this abstract state space S. And now I go to these fractions, and I have a total count um, n element, and which is the total number of UMIs I get from this cell. And now I might say the fractions of my we, uh, we, so this is the total count, is the total count that we actually sequence, which of course only a small part of all the other things. And now we say that uh, the observed counts, count vector k for this cell comes out of a multinomial with uh, y and N. So essentially we say any cell it has some theoretical state which is one-to-one -one mapped to an expected fractions. So these are the expected fractions. And our actual fractions are drawn out of these expected fractions uh, by a multinomial. Multinomial here simply means essentially uh, we add up these cells um, that the probability that uh, the number of counts which fall on gene i is, uh, is expected to be fraction i, which, if you think about it a bit, uh, especially if you assume that this n is actually a derived value which you get out of the data, and this year you have different way of hand waving around that, but in the end you come to the conclusion that k i the expression for one specific gene then follows a Poisson 
with some x, i, and uh, times with y, i times s. Where y, i is the expected fraction for this gene, s is the total number of counts. Right, I always call it s, not n, in all my other slides. And y, i times s is one the expected number of counts I get for this thing. And another way to come to a similar conclusion is that you say, um, my real cell has a few hundred thousand uh, RNA transcripts. My actual cell has, I, se I sequence only typically 1,000 or 2,000 counts for each cell. So um, if the gene has a, if the real uh, cell has 100,000 cells and I pull out and, uh, a fraction y of these can belong to our gene of interest, and when I pull them, and when I pull from these 100,000 cell uh, transcripts, I sequence 1,000 transcripts, what is the probability that I get K cells with a hypergeometric distribution? And if uh, the fraction is small compared to one, then this gets approximated by a Poisson. And in, in a way, the Poisson isn't even approximation. It's really what's happening here that uh, because you could also say that there is already Poisson noise from this biological thing, that with two cells in exactly the same state might have slightly different numbers of counts because the actual production of cells, of uh, transcripts, is a Poisson process. But in general, so when I said it doesn't, it has to be cells, this kind of, of observation with Poisson noise is not limited to cells, it's not limited to biology, but it occurs whenever your input data is counted. And whenever it is counted from a sample, where I here mean sample in the sense of Stichprobe, of a small randomly selected part of a bigger whole. Whenever you do that, where you have a big hole, a big thing like the hundred thousands of transcripts in a cell, and you take out a small sample of only two thousand transcripts, which you actually manage to sequence, and uh, you do that, then um, then uh, your, uh, you model your data with this Poisson distribution. And this is a very general thing because you get this very often by uh, in all kinds of observations. Uh, be it in, in ecology, you want to see how many fish of a certain uh, species are in the river and you catch altogether 1,100 fish and count how many is. Be it in economics, you, want, uh, you have a machine and want to count how often does this machine produce a defect. All this is governed by the Poisson distribution. So this whole thing is pretty uh, general. One thing which we, we will add in a moment is that we will wonder how precise are these expected fractions actually defined by the state and how well do we know the state and how well do we want to know the state? Because here we assume that the expected fractions are defined very precisely, uh, are defined without variance, that this is sort of a, it's unknown but constant. And uh, that has an and uh, that has a bad side effect because, as we've discussed before, um, when you estimate a fraction from a Poisson noise, so if I estimate now an estimated fraction y hat is the observed k over s, then the precision of this y hat estimate goes up with k. So the Poisson, uh, so the Poisson noise will tell us Poisson noise model will tell us that it's fine to be quite far off with your y hat if your k is small, or rather, but if that the y hat can be, um, let's be more precise, what we often want to estimate is log y hat, is log k over s, maybe plus some pseudo count or something like that. And um, here, the absolute, the relative uncertainty of y hat becomes an absolute uncertainty under the log. So the bigger k, or the bigger the expectation of k, the more precise gets this value and can become arbitrarily precise. If k 
is in the area of 10,000 when we expect the, when Poisson will tell us the standard deviation for k is square root of 10,000, so this is 100. So if we expect for k something like 100 versus if we expect something like 10,000, then in this case, we Poisson noise will tell us that the precision that we expect is 1 over square root of 100, so 1 over 10 is 10 percent, and here it is 1 percent. So the higher k, the more precision the Poisson noise will us expect, which means for our loss function that in order to get a good loss, the impact of very highly expressed genes has a much higher impact. Even small deviations in the, in the uh, estimate for the fraction will have a huge impact on the loss if k is large compared to if k is small which means that our autoencoder will put most of its effort in getting the large fractions right, which might not be what we want to do because the large fractions are all the housekeeping genes and stuff anyway. And actually, want, we do not want the autoencoder to neglect the lowly expressed genes. And hence, it might be useful to tell the autoencoder to separate off with the precision and say once the precision is at least 10%, it's good enough for us. Now concentrate on the other stuff. And we do that by using as our last function a, uh, the negative binomial instead of a Poisson loss, where, you know, in the Poisson, uh, where, because, you know, the variance, if k follows a Poisson distribution, uh, lambda with, uh, follows some Poisson distribution such that uh, the expectation of k is mu, then we know that the variance of k over mu is, um, let's see, can I write this correctly now, 1 over mu. And if we say k follows a, pros a negative binomial distribution with some parameters, again writing mu for its expectation, and the variance of k over mu is 1 over mu plus some constant alpha. So the negative binomial is a smearing out of a Poisson distribution where we add some, where we add some constant alpha, which basically means if mu becomes large enough that 1 over mu gets sort of comparable in size to alpha and no longer dominates over this alpha, the precision that we want to reach saturates off. And this is why in a moment we will switch over to the negative binomial instead of the Poisson, because there we can specify this alpha which tells us at which precision we say this is now good enough. But the crucial point at the beginning is whenever we have a counting process, where we have integer counts, we should think about uh, a mean squared error is usually wrong because these counts are not, uh, counts are never normally distributed. We follow a Poisson distribution or a mixture distribution of a Poisson uh, such that the rate parameter of a Poisson is drawn from some other distribution. And for the negative binomial, we draw it for the gamma. I think we talked about this last time. We want to uh, we want to say that um, we reconstructed that we reconstructed error. Where are we here? Here. You remember. Uh, before we said the loss function yeah. is this here. Now the question is why? Why do we actually use the mean squared error? And the more general thing is we have an error model, as I've just told you. My our error model says that our observation here, the counts k, follow some a specified distribution, namely the Poisson. And um, we want to find and we want, our, uh, we want to optimize the parameters of our autoencoder, so our tensor values, that's where the reconstruction uh, maximizes a likelihood. 
So what we do in a way is we say in general an auto encoder is where's my thing? In general, an auto encoder is a, a function y which takes an input y, pulls it through some function. Um, let's call it g after f. So this is our encoder and decoder, and gets and these two depend on some parameter theta, some set of parameters. So this vector here contains all our tensor things and gives us our new y hat. And what we actually want to do is this theta hat should be those parameters which maximize the likelihood, so the likelihood of observing, uh, that's right, it, which maximize the probability of observing y given mu is y hat. So you say you are, um, you are observed values y, for which you postulate some probability distribution, how they should depend on the expected value, on the predicted value. And this probability distribution, of course, and this mu here is, of course, calculated from this theta. So uh, maximizing this thing goes to that. And this is the original reason why uh, we want, uh, why we usually use a mean squared error. Because if we don't have any better ideas, we just assume central limit theorem and use the normal for that. And we put in the normal and then we maximize this when we quickly realize instead of maximizing the normal likely probability distribution itself, we better normalize the, its logarithm uh, when our constant star falls off and we are left with this, uh, with the stuff in the exponential, which is precisely x minus mu squared. That was uh, Gauss's original reasoning why he introduced the, mean squ the least square criterion. And now, of course, once we've decided that the normal distribution is not the correct uh, thing because the central limit theorem does not apply to count data, uh, we conclude that uh, we have to replace our normal distribution by the Poisson distribution. So if you read this here, you shouldn't think uh, mean squared error, you should think log logarithm of a normal distribution, uh, of a PDF of a normal distribution. So, where are we here? Now, that's what we've done so far. And here, probably now this won't work because I've changed too much in my various stuff here. Single AE, but it still goes down a bit. So here's the next thing that I've now done. I introduced the negative binomial loss. This is what we talked about last time. And what I've just said that I want to get this extra theta here I called it alpha, I think here I called it theta, to uh, get this down a bit. I calculated the negative binomial loss and just put it here. This is just the formula that we have. And if I run it with this now, let's see if this now works. Um, then I might get something which puts less effort on the bigger and more effort on the smaller. And we can run this a moment and see what it does. As you can see here, I have put here 0 0.3 for my, um, uh, for this alpha here. So theta is 1 over alpha, which is a detail I think we talked about last time, but I don't want to get hold up uh, now over this. Usually, if you look up in the Wikipedia, the formal for the negative binomial distribution, you find it in terms of the parameter theta, which is exactly the reciprocal of this thing. And we call it the size parameter for weird reasons. So now here you see this also works quite nicely. And maybe I, I could now run the UMAP to improve on this thing. but. Uh, let's do, let's now come to the final stuff, 
where we introduce, where we go from a linear to a non-linear, because that's what I actually wanted to do today. So, so one aspect that I've changed is that I replaced the loss by this negative binomial loss. We have to specify this theta, which, as you see, I've just switched to the constant value 0.3 squared, and which means I accept a variation of plus minus 30 percent on the uh, on on the fractions. So now here we what I've now done here is I take my network as I have it before and before we had in this network let's have a look at it once more you see this was our old network here simply the encoder was a linear model from 1500 to 30 and the decoder was the same thing backwards with two different things and now here this is the model and I just rewrite this class here down here and as you can see here, it works the same as before. The forward still calls an encoder to, the, to get the latent, and the decoder gives, gives y hat. But I've changed here by how I've written the encoder. Namely, the encoder has now, it's going to now consists of three elements. And let's first write it like this. This here means you have a linear model from 1500 to 200 and another linear module from 200 to 20. So these are two matrices which uh, simply sit like this. Notice that the bias equals false is missing. So I allow to, so now the linear model is something like AX plus B. So a linear model contains of here a um, 1500 by 200 matrix, which is to which the vector is multiplied and then a bias vector is added, which is, and my parameters are the elements of a matrix and the elements of a bias vector. Last time we explicitly instructed the thing to remove the bias vector, now we put it back in. Um, using the bias vector solves one little issue, the point with the gene means, which we always had to subtract and add, now this in a way happens automatically. Uh, but but the other thing that this happens is that we have now dramatically increased the parameter space. Before the parameter space was 1500 times 20 el matrix elements, so something like 30,000 elements. Now it's 1500 times 200 plus 200 times 20. So this is now, I don't know, maybe a few hundred uh, uh, parameters. So this was my old module. You see here with a 1,500 in features, 20 out features. And I think uh, there was this uh, torch network summary. Simply printing should give it. Oh, this is nice. Let's try if this works. Print M. Nope. Model summary, okay. M punct summary. Doesn't work. Well, if it doesn't work, then we can see it anyway. We see here that the old model has here these parameters, 1500 by 20, and the new model now will have much more. But so our parameter space becomes much larger. And if the parameter space becomes larger, then this means the space of potential functions that this encode thing uh, does also becomes larger. Because in a way, we can think about this encode thing as a function which maps our 1500 dimensional vector to a 20 dimensional vector. And we want to optimize over a large space of functions. And before we optimized over the space of all linear functions, now I want to enlarge this many more functions over the full space of all linear functions. I have to go nonlinear. And one way to go nonlinear is we will see in this moment, because what I've done here is I have now increased the parameter space, but in a manner which is inefficient, because uh, if I just have two linear matrices, one after the other, so with sequential means apply one matrix, then apply the other matrix. 
when of course I can simplify this by multiplying the two matrices with each other and then again I have only a 1500 by 20 dimensional. So just replacing the saying instead of one linear function I chain two linear functions doesn't help because it doesn't enlarge the, the function space. I now have more parameters which might influence the optimization process. It, it, uh, it's the parameter, the function space is the same because what's happening here in this self and encode is we have in a way this encode is a mapping of a parameter vector to a function. And in the, originally we said it maps a list of 1500 by 20 parameters to the function which, which, is, uh, uh, which is made by the matrix. So we have a mapping between a parameter space, R to the K, to a function space, F. And if I now incre increase the parameter space, do I increase the function space? If I just say, okay, my use, my mapping thing is take the parameters, arrange them in two matrices and multiply the two matrices, then I haven't enlarged the function space to what I have before. It's still a 1500 by 20, so a 30,000 dimensional parameter space. And a 30 di it's a 30,000 dimensional function space, even though the parameter space is larger. If I now, however, I now prevent the multiplying by the two matrices by putting something in between, then my parameter space, not only the parameter space, becomes larger, but also the function space. And this is why I now say my mapping here is the, is, means that I take one matrix, then I take, uh, so I apply x to the first matrix, then I apply some nonlinear function, and then I apply this to the second function. So x is first pushed through the first matrix, then through the nonlinear, and then through the second one. If this thing were just the identity, then I could multiply the two matrices and would get again a matrix as before. But as I've put the nonlinear function in between, I cannot multiply it anymore. And therefore, I have genuinely enlarged the function space. Now, there's two things. It could be that if you just enlarge the parameter space without enlarging the function space, that you help the optimizer to get around local minima. But you just notice the stuff looked convex anyway. With this stuff here, we now generally enlarge the parameter space, no matter what functional thing is. And people always thought this has to be a sophisticated function. But it later turned out that if we use here for FNL, a very simple function. So simply keep x as it is. If it's positive, replace it by zero if it's negative. This simple function called the rectifying linear unit, rectifying linear unit. So as you can see, there was a, a electrical engineer at work rectifying is a uh, electrical engineering term for the process of removing the negative part. You might know the diode in electronics, which lets electricity pass only in one direction. So if you run, push an alternating current through a diode, you remove all the negative part. That's why engineers call this a rectifying effect a rectifier, but of course we might simply call whatever. So this is why this is now called the ReLU. And that's what we do here. We have this sequential thing, which, as you can see, it does this. So the, sec the, sequential, the sequential thing itself is just a convenient way of saying, here I give you a list of functions or of modules please push everything first through the first module, then through the next module, then through the third module. And in this way, I can tell my encoder is 
push it through a 1500 by 200 matrix, then through the ReLU, and then through the 200 by 20 matrix. So that we go from 1500 uh, numbers to 200, then we make the ReLU, and then we go from 200 to 20. And for the decoder, we do the same backwards. And now what I will do now next is let's look here at our, um, at our mean. With, uh, with the purely linear stuff, we have a loss which goes down to 0.4166. And if we now add this nonlinear, we have a larger function space, so we might get a better approximation which should bring us further down with this. Or four or two, or one seven, or one two. Now we are already lower than we were here before. You see here we never got below four one six. Now we quickly go beyond that. Um, and this can be quite helpful. And now let's see how this affects our um, how this affects our uh, UMAP reconstruction. I let it run down a little bit more, and while I do this, I show you again what the outcome was. You remember this point, plot from last time, where um, we always uh, use different smoothing processes in order to see how the expression of our gene aquaparine depends on pseudotime. And here we used the PCA, and we said, well, if we use the PCA reconstruction for this gene, the PCA can never drop below 10 to the minus 4 because we did it with this strange thing. And when we added, decided, let's try, the, the, uh, PC, let's try this uh, PCA linear autoencoder with Poisson loss, so with GLM PCA, what we've done up to just now. And with that, uh, you see it looks much better. We, the value now goes down to 10 to the minus 5 and so on. And then here something weird happened, which I still don't quite understand, and I'll probably have to look at it a bit deeper. I think it's actually... ...at home, and when I looked at the autoencoder, it looks quite nicely, but it has this weird floor at the bottom, and it can't get below that. Which might be because our autoencoder, when we look at it here, see here now we are at 1.384. Let's remember this. Uh, our autoencoder still has this 10 to the minus 4 thing. Now I will do the attempt to quickly fix this by saying here, why, where do I calculate why? Here I calculate why. Let me quickly copy over. Here is my Y. Gene means R, and I have to put the gene means, of course, before. So this is now calculating why this way, and my feeling is now that we have the autoencoder, which can do nonlinear stuff, we should be able to get a better thing by multiplying it here with a much larger number, so that even small counts properly get mapped by the thing. So I write here 10 to the 6, and here I also have to write then 10 to the 6. And now with this, let's see how far down we get now. And let's see how good our data looks with this. Uh, now we get into this small little issue that I, I put it at the wrong network, right? Uh, I should have put it here, sorry. I'm now making a mess. Stop it, switch over here to this or to encoder version. So this needs a bit of cleanup, I think. So I put my Y here, and now with a 10 to the 6, I replace the 6 here, and now I get my new network, and then I can retry this. Um, I can retry this and see if it goes down further. 
we can also retry the UMAP and see whether it mixes the stuff with different uh, sequencing depths forever. At that point, we should quickly recap of why we did the whole thing. Our original idea behind the whole thing is that looking at a single cell gives us too much noise. You see here how uh, noisy things, single cells are in uh, if you look at the, individu at the expression of a cell in the, in the individual cell, because if in the weakly expressed genes where you see two counts or three counts makes quite a difference in this plot, and we can't work with this properly. So we want to somehow, instead of looking at actual cells with all the Poisson noise, we want to look at idealized cells where the Poisson noise has been removed. And because of this, we try to push the cells through this autoencoder in order to denoise them by assuming that uh, we that um, if we force the the network to reconstruct the cell going through this bottleneck of having only um, uh, where are we here having only 20 uh, data elements to describe each cell. So you know this is what is happening here. Um, we go, uh, we, uh, imp we force the network to uh, store the most useful data and, uh, and remove the signal. I want to write this down uh, in a proper way. So the general denoising autoencoder means denoising autoencoder. We have a following model. We assume that each cell is characterized by some real l frac vector, which I call Y. And then I have a noise process. in our case Poisson noise, to get a count vector k, observed noisy counts k. And then now I run him through the autoencoder. The autoencoder now uses a decode an encode function, which maps this um, which maps these k's to a, uh, to a Latin vector, let's call it x, where, where x comes out of a uh, very small, maybe only 20. So the encoder contracts from a high dimensional space to a low dimensional space. And then we have our latent vector x, which tries to compress everything that there is to be said about the data vector k in just 20 dimensions. And from this, we now have a decoder, which takes this x to some reconstructed, let's call it mu hat. And then we have our reconstruction loss, which is the probability of a noise process, which is the probability of observing, uh, well, let's say it like this. And to, to get our loss, we imagine that this mu hat, we ask how close is this mu hat to the real y. And to do this, we run the mu hat through the same noise process as the real y was done and compare with the observed counts. So this is why we take the noise process and ask what is the probability of observing the counts k given this mu hat. Following this noise process, and we say we want to maximize this likelihood, and or I take the log, I minimize this. 
And this is the general autoencoder. You have a noise process which distorts your data before you can measure it. You have a model for this noise process in the term of a probability distribution. You have your network, which now tries to find two functions, one encoder and one decoder function. And this function can be drawn out of a large function space. And they are parameterized by parameters. In our case, all the elements in the two matrices. And when we go with this from k to x, and we go back from x to the mu hat, which should be as close as k as possible, and how close it is, we don't judge by a simple mean squared error, by, but by judging how likely is the noise process to get this k out of this mu. And the idea is that when the autoencoder will have will be forced to concentrate on putting the non-noisy parts of k into x and push the, and lose the noisy parts to get maximum information by being in this bottleneck here. And we call this an information bottleneck because we have to push these 200 uh, this many, this information from many genes through this small opening of only 20 dimensions. And this forcing uh, the data is through this bottleneck is what makes the autoencoder powerful. Mm -hmm. So, but, and here we now got this thing out uh, with a 10 to the 6. And I could now quickly try to write this out. Let's see if I manage here. My uh, mu hat for aquaparin. What was the number of aquaparin? Three, five, six. Or I could also simply three, five, six, comma, and dot shape. Is this now correct? 1500, no, this was wrong because these were the genes, comma. Here we have them, and now I would like to plot them against the pseudotime. Unfortunately, I have a pseudotime in Python and not in R. Let's see if I quickly try this, get it, otherwise I don't even try it. Who is good in pandas? Huh? Yes, and read CSV in Amazon, E-A-G-L-M-P-C-A-E-F. -E I don't even have the date. Yes, uh, this is annoying, and, let's, and I don't want to. No, I don't have it there. Let me quickly push it over here. Just a problem, so just a moment, mint, right? And I need a EF LS CD. Here it is. So and uh, SCP. I punkt bioquant uni heidel punkt de doppelpunkt um, Now I've written it at the wrong MV S C A E. Yeah. So here it is. So now I want the DPT pseudo time from this thing. See if it works like this. And works very good. And now I want to plot uh, my 
bisschen. Blood.scatter. Let's see. Maybe this works. Can't convert code on zero device. Okay, this is the thing. We already know this. This needs one dchatch and one numpy. Uh, one CPU. Numpy does automatically. Okay, and now we can compare here with what we what I've done before. Here, it went down to point 10, and I put the log axis. How do I tell this to make my log axis negative? And to make the axis logarithmic, let's do it by hand. np.log10, s gleich comma 1. So, and now this actually looks quite decent compared to the other thing. Uh, so here is the one thing, and here is the other thing. That was my auto encoder before, and as we can see, it now goes down here to a count of, so this is a log of zero, minus one, minus two. And here I also have zero, minus one, minus two, and here it now looks okay. I could make my red line into it, but uh, you have to now imagine that we push the magenta line over there because I don't want to now try to <laughs> move it from one computer to the other. So overall, we have now managed to get a good reconstruction here even for the late pseudo time, and that's quite remarkable because we are here at an expression of 10 to the minus 2. So only every hundredth cell gets, a, uh, gets an actual count. And nevertheless, Instead of seeing, um, in, uh, it managed to denoise this and sort of, if you want to, it essentially smeared out. Where's my salt and pepper stuff? Uh, right here. This is where I wanted to go. So if I look at the raw counts, I see here these individual dots, which is something like one, one among a hundred cells. It, it smeared this out here. And smearing this out, we could simply do it as we did it at the very beginning by kernel smoothing, by just saying for every cell we take its hundred nearest neighbors and take the average, which sort of works, but uh, with the autoencoder we get now a much more sophisticated thing because the autoencoder can also take care of sudden changes. For example, here, take here this effect of how here uh, the expression of aquaporin changes quite dramatically over a small space in UMAP, which a kernel smoother couldn't do because the kernel smoother always takes the same big neighborhood and smooths everything out over the size of his neighborhood. While a nonlinear autoencoder is also in the able to make nonlinear um, functions like how we uh, how this goes along here, from here to here along a nonlinear path. But the autoencoder has given us two things. On the one hand, it has given us a denoised reconstruction of our gene expression. On the other hand, it also has given us new Latin coordinates which we could use instead of a PCA to run our UMAP. And the new UMAP, well, I haven't run it yet, but the new UMAP also should look a bit nicer. This way, I guess we finish for today. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, because we haven't looked at it at all in this lecture, and we don't have time to do much in the last remaining lecture. I think there's one week remaining in the term, right? Let's check on the calendar. Uh, is inference because in biology you always want to compare something. You want to know does this pattern of aquaporine over pseudotime change between young and old mice or between mice with and without the inter interferon receptor gene. Remember this was a knockout experiment. So we should uh, at the moment, we used all these cells together, but of course, we still have an information which of these cells were from wild-type mice and which were from genotype, from knockout mice. So obviously, what we should have done long is make a go already is pull out these things and look at this and make this smooth pseudotime here. 
and make one line, but make four lines. Two lines for the two wild type mice and two lines for the two knockout mice. In the same way, maybe I should make my reconstructed colors in four different, um, uh, my reconstructed uh, uh, expressions in four different colors for the four different mice. And then I can ask, is the difference uh, between, this, between the lines from a knockout and a wild type mice really much larger than the difference between two knockout mice or two wild type mice in order to judge whether uh, uh, the knockout has any effect on the temporal distribution of aquaporin 4 expression. And that's, of course, the step that we are missing so far, but this is essential to get any interesting biology out of the whole stuff. So even if I don't manage to show you something to it, maybe I manage next time, I'll see. Uh, you already, I wanted to mention this already now that you see what actually the next part is that is missing. And this is also where currently the methodological research sits because if I do what I've just described and when I do some kind of uh, fishery and hypothesis test, then I might ask, is this correct to compare across different data if I use the data from all of them to smooth it or does this mess things up and cause for an information leak where one messes up our uh, significance. Um, yeah. If we don't get to that, then this should be the content probably of a hypothetical uh, part two of this course, but I don't know if we do that. But if you are interested in getting there, let me, uh, in, in maybe continuing or something like this, let me know. The last part we have to talk about it, unfortunately now we are only so few again, is uh, who now needs a grade? Any of you needs a grade? I think it's only those people who are not here today who need a grade. So uh, then that's no point of discussing how we do this. Then let's uh, finish for today.